I still find it funny how this game tells you that there's more levels awaiting you in quote unquote issue one. And I guess that's what happens when your subscription gets you discs instead of magazines or comic books. Today on Ancient DOS Games, we're taking a look at Catacomb, arguably the progenitor of all things related to Doom. I mean seriously, all you have to do is make this game into a first person shooter and it becomes Catacomb 3D, then you just have to update the game engine and turn the monsters into Nazis to get Wolfenstein 3D, then just update the game engine again and turn the Nazis into demons and you have Doom. Granted, the whole process was more complicated than that, but the point I'm trying to make is that if you flip back through the history of everything that became id Software, this game was where it all started. So let's take a look at those game stats. Catacomb was originally made for the Apple II computer by John Carmack, but was ported to DOS PCs and published by Softdisk in 1990 under their new Gamer's Edge subscription service, which is basically a thing you'd pay for so that every two months you'd get a disc with a game on it delivered right to your door. It's a one-player action game running at 320x200 resolution using either a CGA 4 color mode or EGA 16 color mode, and supports PC speaker sound. As for its current release date, the game has always been freeware since it was given out on a free sampler disc to promote Gamer's Edge and to get people to sign up for it. Heck, Dangerous Dave, the platformer made by John Romero, which I covered way back in episode 25, was on the exact same disc. That said, it's surprisingly hard to find downloads of this game anymore, but one place that does still have a copy for download is the RGB Classic Games website at www.classicdosgames.com. Now believe it or not, there is actually a throwaway story to this game. It's just, well, not in the game itself, but in the accompanying text file. You play the role of a wizard named Petten Everhale, who's been tasked by another wizard to go to the catacombs of Kierlon Palace and recover all the lost treasures buried within. Yeah, it's not really any more complicated than that. The gameplay is relatively straightforward. You control Petten from an overhead perspective, moving left, right, up, or down, and flinging fireballs in those same directions. You also have a button allowing you to strafe. Now while holding this button down, you won't change which direction you're facing no matter which direction you move in, allowing you a surprising amount of maneuverability given your movement limitations. That could possibly make this the first PC game where you could actually do that. I know one of the first console games with this capability from an overhead perspective was Blaster Master. You may have also noticed by now that the gameplay goes disturbingly fast. Well, this is actually intentional and not a result of the speed of the system. No matter how fast or slow your system is, or how many cycles you set under DOSBox, this is the speed the game plays at. So right away you have to get used to the fact that everything moves really fast and you need to react just as fast in order to survive. Since the controls are slightly unresponsive, you're going to need to be ready at all times to take advantage of what Petten can do. First of all, you have a special shot power gauge. Pressing the fire button rapidly will simply shoot small fireballs at your enemies, whereas holding the fire button down charges your shot power. Once the gauge is full, releasing the fire button releases a powerful fireball that passes straight through everything and does considerable damage to the stronger enemies. You also find potions and scrolls during your journey. Each potion restores your body to maximum health, and since you're going to be taking a lot of hits, you're going to be using a lot of potions. Thankfully, even though the status bar can only show 10 potions at a time, you're allowed to carry as many as you can find. You also come across scrolls, which, when found, will randomly be either a bolt spell or a nuke spell. When cast, the bolt spell rapidly fires a chain of massive fireballs in the direction you're facing, while the nuke spell fires a burst of fireballs all around you, taking care of any weak enemies in the immediate vicinity. You're also on the hunt for treasure chests, which are worth points and will go towards your final score. Like Duke Nukem, there's no random score elements in this game, so there's very likely a particular maximum score that can be reached, though I have no idea what it is. Now, believe it or not, this game has 10 levels. And why do I say that? Well, look what happens once you get to level 5.
Yeah, rest assured, the game isn't actually over. This game is loaded with secret walls, which you can blast away with your fireballs. And some of these secret walls will be apparent, as they'll have little pixels missing or changed to indicate where they are, but corner tiles and completely purple walls will not. So in these circumstances, you just have to blast the walls and hope for the best. Some secret walls can also house items, so it's usually a good idea to explore every nook and cranny for these things. There's also five different kinds of enemies you'll face. Goblins, skeletons, orgers, gargoyles, and dragons. The goblins are those small purplish things, and they go down really easy. Skeletons are the white ones, and while they too go down easy, they move a lot faster. Orgers are those large purple monsters that are actually really easy to deal with since their large size allows you to attack them safely from beyond smaller openings. Gargoyles are giant purple monsters that only appear a few times in the later levels. They can shoot fireballs at you, but their huge size makes it difficult for them to move around, and a couple well-placed, fully charged fireballs will take them out. Lastly is the dragon, which only appears once at the end of the game. It's really huge and can lob really powerful fireballs at you. The best way to take it down is with bolt spells, and if you do it right, you should only have to cast the spell two or three times. As for the levels themselves, most of them are fairly straightforward, but I should probably talk a little about levels 6 and 8. Level 6 is likely going to make you very mad if you don't know what you're doing. The thing is, this level has a very large number of locked doors, and if you don't unlock them in the correct order, you're going to get stuck and have to restart the game. Basically, once you get your first key, head to the door that has two keys behind it. Then head for the double doors which have three keys behind them, being extraordinarily careful not to accidentally open the door immediately behind those keys. Then open the triple doors with the four keys behind them, then open the quadruple doors which lead to the end of the level. I don't think there's an extra key to get at those potions in the middle of the level, but I could be wrong about that. And as for level 8, there's a few useless doors in this level that you don't have to open, including a set of three where you only need to open one of them, and then another door later on that you can simply shoot your way past. And yeah, that's basically all I gotta say about this game. It's extremely simple in its design and in its presentation, and while there's virtually no replay value, it's a fun little thing and worth a go at least once for sake of nostalgia, or just to see the origins of what would later become the 3D Catacomb games. As for DOSBox settings, just leave Cycle set to auto and you're good to go. But if you intend to use a joystick or gamepad, you'll want to make sure you turn button wrap off considering there's five different buttons to map for Fire, Strafe, Potion, Bolt, and Nuke. Actually, even if you don't use a joystick or gamepad, the default controls aren't spaced very well, so either way, you'll probably want to remap them using DOSBox's key mapper. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next week on episode 74, we're going to take a look at a game where you can steal cars, engage in gang wars, rob banks, kidnap children, all kinds of nasty stuff like that. Now, I already know which game you all think it is, except I have one more hint. It's turn-based. Now this one might be a little tricky, but if you have any idea at all, make sure you send your guests to 80gpixelships.com and tune in next Saturday to see this game for yourself.